Trinad pi suni chena torari vas hishnuna Amani na manadena kirtaniya sadahari Hare nama, Hare nama, Hare nama iva kevalam Kalo nasjeva, nasjeva, nasjeva gati ranyata Tonight, with your permission, I'm going to speak some knowledge, some lessons we learn from the Mahabharat. So the sections that I'm speaking about has to deal with after the war was won. The war was fought 18 days on the first day Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna because Arjuna was perplexed Arjuna was bewildered he was unsure of his duty he had many doubts and indeed, he even said to Krishna, O Govinda, I shall not fight. But the turning point was when Arjuna said to Krishna, Shishyaste hang shadi mang twang prapanam Karpanya dosho pahatva sobhava Prichchami dharma samuda cheta my Lord, since I am confused, bewildered, I need you to no longer act as my lifelong friend, but I'm going to take you as guru. I am going to become your disciple. You kindly instruct me. That is the turning point of the whole Bhagavad Gita, perhaps the turning point of the battle of Kurukshetra. Of course, throughout the 18 days, there were other major turning points. But at least in terms of Bhagavad Gita, this is the point where Arjuna submits, surrenders. And so Krishna in chapter 2 begins to instruct Arjuna on the science of the absolute truth. That is what Bhagavad Gita is. All the essential truths required for self-realization are given in Bhagavad Gita. That is why it is called Gita Upanishad. The great saint Shankaracharya has given us a nice meditation he says all the Upanishads there are 108 Upanishads compiled by Vyasadeva he says all the Upanishads are like a cow and this cow is being milked by an expert cowherd boy Govind Krishna and the calf, because a, mil a cow will give milk in presence of its calf out of love. So the calf is Arjuna. So Krishna is milking this cow known as the Upanishads. And as you know, what comes from a cow? Milk, Amrit. Milk is considered Amrit. So Arjuna is receiving the milk coming by Krishna's working this cow of the Upanishads. And Shank Shankaracharya says that devotees, theistic devotees, those who believe in God, and the soul 
They are meant to drink this milk known as Bhagavad Gita. And Shankaracharya says in his prayers, this milk should be drunk daily through your ears. So that was taking place just before the battle began on day one. After Duryodhan was defeated by Bhim, practically speaking, that was the end of the war. Of course, Ashvatama, he carried out the nefarious plan thinking he would please Duryodhan and he thought that he had beheaded the five Pandavas while they were sleeping but he realized that he had not killed the Pandavas but he had killed the Pandavas five sons and then he brought those skulls to Duryodhan who was lamenting, aching gasping slowly dying the scene is described hyenas and vultures were just waiting for Duryodhan to give up his life so that they could come and devour they had already feasted on so many slain warriors because in the battle of Kurikshetra, millions of slain warriors were there on both sides. But when Duryodhan felt the heads, he realized, no, these are not the heads of the Pandavas. Why? Duryodhan said, the heads of the Pandavas are just like iron. And even in his weakened condition, he was easily able to crush the skull. So he said, you have not killed the Pandavas. You have killed their sons. And Duryodhan chastised him. Ashvatama thought that he had done a great service. But Duryodhan revealed, yes, even though we were enemies with the Pandavas, I always hoped that these five sons would remain alive to carry out the Kuru dynasty. And so Duryodhan gave up his life completely frustrated, unsatisfied, miserable existence. Then Ashvatama tried to kill the last remaining heir of the Dynasty, Maharaj Parikshit, who was in the womb of his mother, Uttara, sending the Brimastra weapon. But as happened so many times during the war, Krishna intervened. Krishna interceded at very crucial points in the battle. If it wasn't for Krishna, the Kauravas would have won. So in key strategic points, Krishna did his magic. So when Ashvatama tried to do this, then he was captured by Arjuna and Ashvatama was spared because Draupadi did not want his mother to lament like her. She had lost her five sons, but she didn't want Ashvatama's mother to cry. So she told Arjuna, you sp but Krishna said, wait, wait, me and Bhima, we want you to kill him. But your wife is saying, don't kill him, figure it out. So Arjuna is very intelligent. So what did he do? He disfigured, he cut the jewel because Ashvatama's potency was in the jewel in his top knot. So by cutting the jewel in the top knot, Ashvatama lost all his power. And then you read in the Mahabharata 
how Krishna cursed Ashvatthama that for 3,000 years he would have to roam the earth with no companion and he would suffer all throughout those 3,000 years. So that brings us now the battle is done. You would think after fighting a war, the greatest war for 18 days, you would think the victor would be joyous, but not Yudhisthir. Yudhisthir refused to accept the throne. Why? First of all, he is the son of Dharma. He is Dharma personified. He is the most religious person to a fault, you could say. So strict, so pious, so moral. So he was thinking, now that the battle has been won, millions of soldiers have been slain, their widows and their children are now going to lament, and I'm responsible. So Yudhisthir decided, he was thinking, just like Arjuna, in the beginning, Arjuna was thinking when he was telling Krishna, I don't want to fight, Arjuna was also thinking of running away to the forest. But Krishna convinced him. So Yudhisthira also was thinking like that. He was thinking, yeah, all, I've won the kingdom, but at what cost? I, I don't want it. I want to go to the forest. I want to pursue spiritual life. So we're going to hear how Yudhisthira becomes convinced to accept the throne. But it takes a while. But before we go there, there's this nice scene where Sanjay, those of you who know, Sanjay was servant of Dhritarashtra. During the speaking of Bhagavad Gita and during the war, Sanjay was giving Dhritarashtra blow-by-blow -blow description because he had mystic power. Dhritarashtra and Sanjaya were situated away from the battlefield. And we learn this from Bhagavad Gita. At the end, Sanjaya says, By the mercy of my guru, Vyasadev, Dhritarashtra's father, by the mercy of Vyasadev, I have been able to tell you this whole Bhagavad Gita and throughout the war what is going on because he has that mystic television right now you know we turn on the news at night they show you scenes from this country if this is going on so Sanjaya had mystic television so this exchange here is my whole thing here Lessons to be learned. So what Sanjaya tells Dhritarashtra after the battle is significant. I forgot to do one thing. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. The system is loud enough. You can hear me, right? Not too loud, is it? It's okay? All right. I have a new system. So, let's hear. Dhritarashtra and Gandhari sat alone in their chambers. After Krishna had left them, Krishna went to console them. They were once again overcome by grief. 
The blind king sat with his head fallen to his chest, his breath coming in tearful sighs. He looked like a great tree now shorn of its branches. Then Sanjaya entered the chambers. As he announced himself, Dhritarashtra stood to greet him. Then he collapsed. You could understand. Dhritarashtra has lost all of his sons because Bhima had vowed at the time of the offense of Draupadi when they tried to strip her naked, Bhima vowed, I will kill every one of you, 100 Kauravas. Bhima made that vow and he, he kept it. He killed everything and the last one was the best, Duryodhan, the biggest rascal of them all. Of course, he needed Krishna's help, obviously. Sanjaya lifted the old king gently and said, so listen to what Sanjaya says. Why do you grieve, O monarch? Grief is useless. Eighteen Akshahanis have been killed and the earth is now divested of thousands of kings. All of your sons have been slain along with so many of their kinsmen, friends and counselors. You should now perform their funeral rites. What is the use of lying here shedding tears? So that's our first lesson. I have spoken at dozens and dozens of funerals. This is the same thing Krishna speaks in Bhagavad Gita. Many times in chapter 2. Natvam sochitam arhasi. That word arhasi is significant. You do not deserve sochati to lament. Why? Sanjaya is pointing it out and we'll learn if it comes. Crying is not going to bring anybody back. So you have to, what is called move on. Yes, you feel emotional. You feel grief. That is human nature. Even Krishna. There was one pastime where he was fighting Shalva. And it looked like Shalva had killed Krishna's father, Vasudev. And Krishna cried. So, that is to be expected. But, you have to go on and do your duties. So, Sanjaya is saying, no time for grieving now. You have to perform the funeral rites. Dhritarashtra cried out and dropped back onto the silk rug spread over the floor of his darkened chambers. Sanjaya pulled back the heavy drapes from the nearby window and the sun poured into the room. The king and queen both appeared disheveled and withered with grief. Neither had slept for days. Sanjaya again helped Dhritarashtra to his feet and the old king fell back onto his throne. In a choked voice, Dhritarashtra said, Bereft as I am of sons, friends, and counselors, I will now have to wander the earth in a wretched state. What is the use of living? So you can see, he's now very much affected. It's natural. A lot, now here, Listen to this. Alas, I did not heed my advisor's words, and now I lament. And that is so true. Because leading up to the war, so many times, Dhritarashtra was advised, don't do this. Make peace. Bhishma tried to counsel him. His own brother, Vidura, repeatedly told him Krishna just before tried to make a peace proposal so now Dhritarashtra when it's too late 
Now he real, oh, I should have listened. So, lesson, we should not be like that. When we, good, when we get good advice from a friend, we should take it. That's the key. So many people will give advice, but if it comes from a well-wishing friend or from a superior, in the case of Dhritarashtra, it was superiors. Bhishma was superior. He should have at least... Vidur is his brother. You could say he's junior. Okay. But Bhishma, that he should have listened to. Also, Drona. Drona also warned him. What to speak of Krishna? For you, if Krishna had comes to you, you're going to take Krishna. Am I right? If Krishna came to you with some instruction, you'll probably take it because you're devotees. Dhritarashtra continues, Krishna told me to make peace with the Pandavas and rule the earth without a rival. Bhishma and Vidura agreed, but I chose to follow my wicked son. And that was the major fault of Dhritarashtra for his whole life. He took shelter of Duryodhan, his son. Yes. Krishna told me to make peace with the Pandavas and rule the earth without a rival. It's not that the Pandavas, they would have let Duryodhan rule. All the Pandavas wanted was their own kingdom, like they had before all the nonsense. It's not that they wanted to have any, they were willing. You rule, Hastinapur will take care of Indraprastha. But Duryodhan's greed and hubris wouldn't allow it. Bhishma and Vidura agreed, but I chose to follow my wicked son. And that was Dhritarashtra's downfall from the beginning because when Duryodhan was born in the forest with all the pots, at that time Vidura spoke. He said, this son, kill him immediately. Why? This son is going to be the cause of the destruction of your whole dynasty. Now, Dhritarashtra did not know, but Vidura is actually Yamaraj himself playing in this Krishna Leela. But he didn't know that. If Yamaraj came to you in a dream and said, you should do this or else, I think we would listen. I know I would. Now my son is dead and I am experiencing an ocean of grief. Surely my sins in previous lives have been great and thus I now suffer. Who on earth is more afflicted than me? Destiny has dealt me unbearable blows. I will end my life. Let the Pandavas come here and see me, bent upon taking that final great journey toward the eternal Brahman. So there's a kind of philosophy that, I, I forget the technical term, but the philosophy is, at a funeral, everybody all of a sudden gets very philosophical and serious. And they repent their ways and they think, oh, okay, from now on, I'm going to be good. But five minutes after leaving the funeral, the old kicks in and you forget all the promises you made. Does it, was that? That's it. Yes. Thank you. This is why I like coming here. It's a very learned assembly. Smashana, what is it called? Smashan? Vairagya, right. Actually, that's exactly how it's written in Prabhupada's books. You get two points for that. Sanjaya, however, shook his head. He had heard Dhritarashtra's empty lamentations so many times before. Yes, throughout, before the war, Dhritarashtra would sometimes come to his senses. 
But then immediately he would become overcome. So Sanjay had heard this kind of Dhritarashtra before. Taking hold of the king's hand, he replied, O king, cast off your grief. You are well acquainted with Vedic injunctions regarding the certainty of death and the eternality of the soul. Everything happens as it should. All men receive the proper results of their own acts. For your fault, your sons have been destroyed. Only out of covetousness did you not follow your... Excuse me. Only out of covetousness did you follow your son, who was ever guided by wicked men, Shakuni and others. That was his associates. There's an expression we have in English. You know a person by the company they keep. If you see a person's associates, then you know what kind of person it is. Thus, it has been your own perverted intelligence which cuts you now exactly like a sharp sword. So many people tried to redirect you to the path of virtue, but you would not listen. Although learned and intelligent, you were not qualified to be emperor of the earth, for you lack discrimination. He wanted that. He wanted it, but actually, he was unfit. First of all, he's blind. Right there, that's a disqualification. But he wanted it so much, that's why he always pushed Duryodhan. Through Duryodhan, he could enjoy the prestige. He could still get all the honor and praise and attention and comforts of being the king. As he had done on previous occasions, Sanjaya made it clear to Dhrishtarastra that he had only himself to blame, and now he was forced to repent. So this, this applies to all of us. When you have a proper understanding of the lessons of Bhagavad Gita, you no longer blame anyone else for your lot in life. You take what we call responsibility. That whatever is happening, I'm to blame. You don't ever consider yourself a victim. Because as soon as you start to accept yourself as a victim, you're not going to make any spiritual progress. You'll be what we call the blame game. I don't have this because of this person. I don't have this because of this person. No. If you want to make real advancement, you have to take ownership. Yes, this bad thing is happening. It's my fault. Now, let me act in such a way that in the future, I don't create any more bad scenarios as I'm doing now. Because keep in mind, karma is not eternal. We commit a certain transgression. So there will be suffering, either at present or in the future. But that particular action has a beginning, middle, and end. So each particular karmic event is not eternal. But our problem is we keep making bad mistakes, trying to rectify them by making more bad mistakes. That is why the cycle of karma seems to be eternal because we're constantly making mistakes. But if you have studied Bhagavad Gita, there's a way to end all your mistakes. What is it? Surrender to Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, 
Sanjaya continues. A man who keeps a burning coal in the folds of his cloth and who is then burned by the fire is simply a fool if he laments. There's another description in the Uddhava Gita where Krishna tells Uddhava, if I bite my own tongue, who's to blame? Right? I have nobody to blame but me. So that is how a transcendentalist sees whatever is happening. Oh, this bad thing is happening. I must have done something, and now I'm getting the result. Again, let me act in such a way that I don't create any future karma. And how do you do that? Bhakti yoga, devotional service, which you're doing right now, by the way. You're doing the first item of bhakti. You're hearing the message of Krishna. So, for now, you're not creating any karma unless you're not listening. But if you are paying attention, you are not creating any karma and by hearing, there's this nice verse we we heard about it last night. I did a program at Kundan's house last night. And we heard this night's verse where it says that by hearing the message of Krishna, Krishna in the heart becomes very pleased. <laughs> 